I'm Gabriel Perez, uh, one of the co-organizers. Um, and I am based at uh, Perfect, the Department of History of Art. Uh, I specialize uh, on the representations of uh, memory, conflict, and gender. Uh, I published on uh, the commemoration and memory of the First World War in Britain, uh, on the representation of uh, the terrorist, uh, in uh, recent artistic, contemporary artistic work, uh, and also on art history and the census, and I'm currently working on a monograph on the uh, cultural memory, um, visual cultural memory of Cyprus. Um, and uh, as we said before at the very beginning, I we worked with Colette uh, J. Prosser uh, and Leslie Hawking Deck uh, on uh, the uh, Ottoman ex Ottoman cities um, and their transcultural memories. And basically, his work today stems um, very much out of that. And I will take you to Marseille, to France. Although I'm not a French studies specialist, so um, I'm, uh, but I'm very interested in museums, and my publications are around museums mostly. Uh, so uh, I will be talking about the museum, uh, the uh, museum uh, of Mediterranean, European and Mediterranean uh, civilization. Museum was inaugurated in 2013, the year Marseille uh, was cultural capital of Europe. The museum was part of a wider project, the Euro Mediterranean Urban Development Project, which was initiated in 1995. A partnership between the French government, the city of Marseille, uh, local and regional authorities, and the European Union. At the time, it was hailed as the largest regeneration project in Europe and a catalyst for economic and cultural development to make the troubled city of Marseille uh, one of the top 20 European cities. Its key mission uh, was to showcase Marseille as, and I quote, the strategic crossroads between Europe and the Mediterranean. The museum was designed by architect Rudy Ricciotti, who was born in Algeria of Italian, origin, uh, of Italian origins uh, and moved to France when he was three. Museum was the first major national museum to be located outside Paris and is the backbone of the architectural ensemble um, that is known as J4, which was the old uh, key in the uh, Port of Marseille, which is comprised of um, which is um, comprised of the regional center of the Mediterranean CRM, designed by Stefano Boeri, uh, and according to its architect, the design aims to embrace the sea. The center's mission is to provide opportunities for exchange and dialogue amongst all Mediterranean cultures. Uh, the Fort uh, Saint-Jean um, and the uh, Musée Recap de Provence housed in what used to be the Port of Marseille uh, sanitary station. Musée uh, brought together uh, the uh, main French ethnographic collections of the former Musée des Arts et Traditions Populaires and those of the Musée de Londres. Uh, some of the collections were, of course, the Musée de uh, what was considered as uh, art premier. Um, the museum aims, according to its website, to its website, to explore contemporary cultural evolution and the reinvention of conscience, fields, and disciplines in Europe and in the and Mediterranean. What is striking about uh, the museum? Besides its concrete lattice, which uh, uh, envelops the structure, are the bridges that connect it first to the Fort Saint Jean and from there to the old part of Marseille, the Panier. I want to concentrate <coughs> on how the main motif of the museum, the bridge that connects it uh, 
uh, and by extension to the Mediterranean Sea, uh, to the city of Marseille, France, and Europe. To do so, I will discuss the exhibition strategies adopted by the museum and the transcultural Mediterranean memories that are alluded to or are absent in the space of the museum. The main permanent exhibition, titled The Gallery of the Mediterranean, consists of four sections and displays a series, uh, according to the museum, sites, people, and journeys. <coughs> the four sections are uh, the birth of agriculture and the emergence of gods, Jerusalem, citizens and responsibility, and beyond the known world. So, um, the agriculture gallery uh, it uses several farming equipment, religious figurines, and works of art um, to highlight uh, the significance of uh, wheat, which, together with uh, grapevines and olive trees, are signaled out as the distinguishing features of the Mediterranean, and which mark it apart from other geopolitical areas such as Southeast Asia and the Pacific. However, what also marks the Mediterranean from all other regions is the fact that the three great monotheistic faiths, according to the museum, the religions of the book, started there, which the exhibition immediately associates with the emergence of citizenship in Greece and Rome, which is then weaved into the development of trade routes and exploration. The exhibits um, are chosen according, accordingly to convey these. The triad of wheat, wine, and olives is stressed through various objects for the extraction of wine, olive, and wheat, and various containers uh, for their uh, storage and uh, transportation. So here, for example, we have uh, jars from Syria, Egypt, Lebanon, Macedonia, and Italy. In dispersed in the exhibits and throughout the galleries are contemporary works of art that are supposed to contextualize and bring to the modern day the exhibits uh, and, and, and Mediterranean cultures. Within the agricultural section, we have, for example, um, uh, again, back to Cyprus again, the video work of a Cypriot artist, Lia Lapith. Her work titled, um, and it's here, So I will be speaking while I watch that. Um, so the end of it is work uh, titled Sakistet, which is a secret word for crushed green olives, uh, is uh, provided with no contextualization by the museum on the sharing of the recipe throughout uh, the Middle East and North Africa. Most importantly, the decontextualization of the work strips it of its political content and message in the context of divided Cyprus and the use by the artist of the recipe to demonstrate the importance of food in the transcultural memories of the Greek and Turkish communities in Cyprus and the possibilities that the share that this shared offers in bringing together the two communities um, and also importantly positioning Cyprus within the wider Middle Eastern context rather than a Western European uh, one. And because the idea Classified and um, sorry. It is exactly this repositioning of the Mediterranean that Misem is subtly trying to achieve. This becomes more evident in the other three galleries of the museum. The Jerusalem Gallery concentrates on the distinguishing features of the three monotheistic religions that developed in the Mediterranean. 
the divided map of the old city of Jerusalem gives no information as to the political context of the city with its long history of conflict. The Crusades are completely erased from the cultural memory landscape of Jerusalem and the space of the museum. The division of the city and of the city and ongoing conflict are completely ignored. Instead, the three religions are shown existing in a vacuum in the city space. The transcultural encounters and exchanges in the city are reduced to the three religions sharing the book. And, um, and here are the old texts. Uh, uh, the book and the, another theme that um, the gallery uh, stresses is the end of times and paradise. And here you can see some of the exhibits. Jeris Jerusalem is portrayed um, as the place of apocalypse and resurrection and the idea of paradise, the resting place before the resurrection, provides the antidote to the troubled present which the museum avoids to address. Examples of syncretic worship in Jerusalem which are well documented are ignored as they do not provide a clear and distinguishing demarcation of the religions. Syncreticism blurs the lines that the museum so favorably wants to maintain. Instead, the pacified and clearly demarcated Jerusalem gallery leads the visitor to the third gallery of the permanent collection, Forms of Citizenship and Human Rights, where I would argue the main message of the museum resides. And here is an example. Here is an Athenian 400 before Christ decree uh, that was issued to Syracuse. Uh, the gallery promotes the Mediterranean as the birthplace of citizenship through ancient Greece and participation in public and political life, the Roman Empire and uh, the Venetian Empire. The apotheosis of citizenship is of course reached in the 18th century when according to Nisem, citizenship as a universal right appeared. A short sentence at the very end of the wall panel informs the visitor that, yes, there are still gender, social, and ethnic inequalities. Um, the gallery demonstrates the principles of citizenship through a series of sculptures and busts from antiquity. The plasticity of the human body and portraiture become markers of civilization and, by extension, humanity uh, and civilization. However, the absence of a representation from Islamic tradition results in a complete absence of examples of citizenship from the Ottoman Empire. In fact, the absence of the Ottoman Empire from a museum dedicated to Mediterranean history and civilization becomes conspicuous in its very absence. We are offered glimpses of the Ottoman Empire uh, when, for example, the Venetian Empire is shown. The map of the Venetian Empire provides the Ottoman Empire as the other of the Mediterranean and the recipient of the trade from Venice instead of the Ottoman Empire exhibited on equal terms as the Venetian. What is also striking from the exhibitionary strategy of the museum is the lack of the inclusion of the Ottoman Empire under the theme of citizenship. The Ottoman Empire was the recipient of thousands of Jews, for example, expelled from Europe during the Spanish Inquisition in 1492, in which the museum chooses to ignore. It was also the empire that offered an alternative form of citizenship. The empire adopted a multi-religious and multi-ethnic model in its social and political constitutions, a system that um, uh, Leslie Pierce, uh, amongst others, describes as polyglot. The term refers not only to the many languages of the empire, the Ottoman Empire, but also the shared religion, historical memory, occupations, and local geography. To establish your argument, Pierce uh, goes back to the establishment of the Ottoman Empire in the Eastern Mediterranean to argue that the Ottoman regime's pluralistic outlook 
drew from the intimacy of contact, experience, and affection that characterized its origins, and especially the cultural exchanges that have been going on in the region since ancient times, and particularly since the 11th century, among Turks and native Christ Christians and Jews. The sultans fosters the chemistry of difference that generated competition for their goodwill and thus nurtures dependence on the imperial state. So they were not doing copies just for the sake of fostering difference. Uh, for example, the Iberian Jews were welcomed and absorbed into the empire because of their financial expertise and their contacts with European bankers. The empire profited from other religious groups as well. Armenian traders figure prominently in the important silk trade with Iran, largely because of the privileged position of their co-religionists there. So the Ottoman regime might had an interest in promoting difference, but the truth <coughs> is that it could hardly have ignored it. But the museum ignores this. And instead, uh, we are led. Uh, of course, to the uh, And it's important <laughs> in establishing democracy and human rights, not only in Europe, but throughout the world. The celebration of the individual <clears throat> as opposed to the whole is demonstrated by the juxtaposition of a series of busts by 20th century artists. Um, and further down, uh, freedom and human rights is further stressed with the segment of the Berlin Wall and the fall of communism, which proves beyond reasonable doubt the triumph of liberal democracies and freedom of expression over, over totalitarianism. Uh, this is further enhanced, of course, by one of Barbara Kruger's posters. Uh, feminism becomes representative of Western civilizations, embracing of human rights and the rights of women and minorities. Interestingly, just behind the Berlin Wall uh, segment, um, and placed under Article 13, <coughs> so you can see it is just behind uh, the wall, and this is what is behind, and on top is Article 13 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which states everyone has the right of, to freedom of movement and residence, uh, with the borders of each state. Uh, we find the work of Palestinian artist uh, Taizir uh, Abuji, Watchtowers from 2008. The work inspired by the uh, work of the German art photographers uh, Bernd and uh, Hilda Pesha, uh, who worked starting in 1959 for a period of over 30 years to document the typology of disappearing industrial architecture of Europe, and particularly their series of photographs of water towns, which you can see on the left. Um, um, a series of Israeli watchtowers uh, along uh, the um, uh, West Bank uh, are uh, portrayed uh, on the right. As a Palestinian born in Gaza, Baniji was not allowed to return to the West Bank. So he commissioned another Palestinian photographer to photograph the towers. The photographs, unlike the perfectly technically captured photographs of the measures on the left, who use a large format camera, shadowless lightning conditions, etc., are not technically and aesthetically perfect. Some of the Israeli watchtower photos are out of focus and others are clumsily framed. For Pantiji, Deestheatrization becomes a poignant political challenge, both in the creation of these photographs and in their reception, as these images challenge viewers to see these functional military constructions as part of a formal architectural heritage that marks the Palestinian landscape. None of this information is provided by the museum, other than the name, title, and date of the work and Article 13 that frames the image. Instead, the series of photographs become re-estheticized and their transcultural memory exchangers are obliterated to a universalizing humanitarian narrative. 
We are then led to the final gallery of the museum and the journeys about Western European nations on the to the New World, but also increasingly within the Mediterranean during the 18th and 19th centuries. These images from the Grand Tour provide the one-way bridging of the Mediterranean, a totalizing vision that aimed to control and simulate. The text panel in the gallery draws our attention to, and I quote, the first voyagers who discovered people and cultures who, whose characteristics they recorded. The fact that the archaeological site of the Mediterranean countries were rooted in the name of science is sidestepped. Three contemporary artistic interventions conclude the gallery and are supposed to provide the other side of the Western gaze and conquest of the Mediterranean. The wall panel places them into three categories, construction, deconstruction, and reconstruction. Uh, the first work uh, are, is by the French uh, couple artist Anne Patrick uh, Poirier from 1978, uh, a work which according to the museum falls under the constructive category which demonstrates uh, the fragility of the ruins of Mediterranean civilization and their importance to the collective imaginary of the Mediterranean. The second work um, is by the Algerian-born uh, Zineb uh, Sedira, Middle Sea from 2008, who now lives in the UK after studying and working in Marseille, is seen by the museum as a reconstructive which, according to the museum, transcends history and remains a focal point of interchange between different worlds. I would argue that Sedira's work, which uh, we can get a glimpse. And 
And the third work, um, uh, which closes the exhibition, um, uh, is what the museum categorizes as a de deconstruction of the Mediterranean, it takes place in the work of, of uh, Joanna Hadri Thomas and Khalil Polly uh, um, a large um, aerial view of Beirut, four meters by three, is cut up into 3,000 pieces stuck on a mural. Each of these 3,000 fragments is numbered. Behind each fragment are written the words, uh, Beirut does not exist. Visitors during the original installation were invited uh, to each choose and take away a piece of the image. The image of of Beirut becomes fragmented. Each time a visitor pulled out a piece, they uncovered a, a bit of mirror which reflected their image. As the fragments were gradually removed, an underlying mirror was revealed, reflecting the viewer and the installation surroundings. The installation embodies a reading of the city which in, is in perpetual mutation and movement, a society uh, to produce multiple meanings and fantasies. The history of colonization uh, that produced the fragmentation of Beirut is obliterated from the space of the museum and the surrounding area. The two bridges that characterize its design lead to a history of colonization. The Fort Saint-Jean, built by Louis XIV on the site, uh, occupied by the military order of the Hôpitalier uh, of Saint-Jean, um, uh, was used throughout the 19th and 20th centuries as barracks and clearing station for the army of Africa. During the years when the foreign legion was based mainly in North Africa, the fort was the final stop-off point for new recruits destined for Africa. For the architect of the museum, the bridges represent, uh, I quote, a feat of French engineering and precision and are unlike any other bridges that, according uh, to the architect, flex. These bridges do not flex. The, uh, as they work uh, by compression. And I would argue there is a lot of compression taking place in the museum. And compression of history, transcultural exchanges, and memories. The, the sanitizing station at the other end of the J4 that used to disinfect the thousands of immigrants that arrived in Marseille from the, the, Mediterranean, from the Mediterranean shores following the end of the Second World War, transformed into the Musée de la Provence, offer a sanitized view of Provence with its pristine landscapes and Mediterranean shores. Marseille, the eccentric part of the Republic as it is also known, uh, and its trans transcultural Mediterranean memories has been completely sanitized. Thank you.